Oh great, a f***ing cape. Someone explain why a bounty hunter would tolerate a piece of fabric flapping on his back and getting in the way of basically every movement. And don't tell me it protects him from the elements, because clearly the wind is all up in here. What is with this dark vignette filter around the edges of the screen? It is purposely present the entire episode, and it was a bad choice. It makes every scene feel darker and more claustrophobic than it needs to. Shonatima. I don't know what musk is supposed to refer to, but I do know young and sweet were used in the comment, and I'm not okay with that. What, no subtitles now? I mean, instinctively, I know what he said, because my mother yelled this at me daily my entire life. Here, I'll fix it. There we go. Surely there are a hundred better places for Quarren to be, considering this is an ice planet, and his moist, delicate tendrils would be sticking to every metal surface instantly. To be fair, having a door that operates like that at a bar seems like it would fail safety protocols if drunk people are operating that door every night, there is zero chance this has never happened before. But with that being said, how would Mando know that shooting the door's power source would automatically close it, or bypass whatever sensor that would keep this entryway from being a regular death trap? It could have just left it open, or malfunctioning where it opened and closed like my sphincter after Thai food, spurting like this dead corpse. I appreciate his focus on the bounty, but what about the zipline grappling shooter? He should be pressing a sweet auto-retreat button or comically wheeling that thing in with squeaky noises and we are not seeing Pedro Pascal's beautiful mug in this scene, or any scene of this episode, for that matter. Is that a bounty puck? Yes, yes it is. And Star Wars is just getting lazy with their naming, because calling these bounty pucks is frankly really stupid. Also, Mithril must know that he has a bounty on his head, and the moment the Mandalorian stepped into the bar, I am certain he would have recognized him as a bounty hunter. Why didn't he make a run for it? There's gotta be a back door. I can bring you in warm. Or I can bring you in cold. No matter how you dress it up, that's still a we can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way cliche. Fun fact, in order to leave the bar, they would have had to step over two halves of an entrail seeping corpse because this show ain't playing. You would think automobile dealers in the frozen tundra would at the very least have vehicles with f***ing tops on them. This is insanity. Mando and his bounty will die of hypothermia in this speeder before they even get to their destination. I'd stay off the ice if I were you. Everything we've seen is ice, so this warning is a waste of air and esophageal effort. Also, this advice proves to be terrible because this guy wasn't even on the ice and he got I mean, damn, those are some perfectly white teeth. Tell me about dentistry and teeth whitening in this world because these are some impressive chompers and suddenly nothing else matters. You've been captured by a bounty hunter who may or may not kill you and you have discovered a closet filled with weapons. Why not take one to defend yourself? What else are you looking for down here? Also, how did he know how to open this console? Are we yada yada our way around this? Ah, uh, this feels a lot better. I haven't evacuated since the solstice. Oh god, it's like the granola folk sharing about what it means to live off the land and their insta stories. I don't want to see you pee off a cliff. I don't want to see your goats mating. I do want to know how you make organic candles though, so stick to that for f sake. But I guess that's not gonna happen this year. Probably not. Why wouldn't Mando start here? What was the point of letting him sit up in the cockpit with him while he flew if he had this capability on board? Oh, that was fast. Carl Weathers is not fighting a predator or a Russian in this scene. Everyone's face is distorted from the cryogenic ice blast, so how is this face scan helping to identify the contents? With all the technology available, wouldn't a DNA reading be far more accurate? Do you want to chit or not? Chit, yeah! I've turned on my screen brightness to max and prayed to the Lord of Light, but I can't see a goddamn thing with this vignette filter. And yes, I know I already sent it, but now that my eyes are strained, I'm really annoyed. Longer than needed shot on a group of stormtroopers because we're supposed to fanboy out and jizz all over ourselves because stormtroopers. What else did he say? He said you were the best in the Parsec. God bless you, Werner Herzog. Acting in a franchise you probably know nothing about and killing it. Let's see the puck. We can only offer you a tracking fob. So is he picking up a Honda Pilot? Seriously, who named this What's the chain code? We can only provide the last four digits. I don't know how you can track down in this neck of the woods, but I'm assuming if Mando asked for the chain code, he needs the chain code. So why is Shrimply Pibbles f***ing around with him here? Doesn't he want Baby Yoda? Who doesn't want Baby Yoda? See, it's okay because the creatures were with Jabba, so they're bad. This means we can torture roast them in front of their loved ones and don't have to feel horrified. His armor is upgraded with what he's brought in, and my question is, what would these fancy hotel soaps become? I'm banking on proper gel insoles, and damn if I'm not bummed, this is totally avoided. This was gathered in the Great Purge. Good to see that Purge Knight carries over from galaxy to galaxy, and Mando. Mandalorian already have masks to wear. How convenient. That's good. I was once a foundling. I know. Foundling flashbacks. Flashlings? Foundbacks? We are all imagining our own version of what is behind this mask. I think it's Pickle Rick. And now this is far more interesting and entertaining. You are a bounty hunter. Yes. I will help you. This actually feels like something Nick Nolte might do when he's not acting, just hanging out in a forest. And when someone randomly wanders into his area, he offers to help them, even though they never asked for it. That's so Nolte. Did you help them? Yes, they died. Well, then I don't know if I want your help. Bando would be excellent at TV sense. Blurg. 
You can keep them both. No, you'll need one. To ride. The way is impossible to pass without a blurred mount. If this is true, how does the bounty droid make it? Better question, why not zippity-doo your ship all the way over? I have spoken. But nobody knows how you were able to speak so clearly considering the rigidity of your lips. This creature goes from attempting to rip an arm off to saddled and happily hopping through the desert in maybe two hours. Tell me it drank something to make it more docile. Tell me once you tried to kill it. You're the alpha. Otherwise, this entire scene is a throwaway attempt to westernize Star Wars. Moment of silence for the costume department for forgetting his pauldron is on his right shoulder. Then why did you guide me? They do not belong here. There will be no peace until they're gone. Got it. Murder for the sake of peace. But why haven't you been wearing your goggles while traversing the desert? Are these cosplay goggles made of glitter and dreams? Then why do you help? I have never met a Mandalorian. I've only read the stories. If they are true, you will make quick work of it. Yeah, but you told Mando earlier that you had helped all that had come through, so you still haven't answered why you helped them. I refuse to believe the Mandalorian is in a hurry. He clearly washed all the mud and animal poo out of his cloak before taking this journey. I don't care that we saw this guy as a human being in a flashback. He's a cyclops. Why else would he look through a telescope like this? The quick and the droid! IG unit, stand down! I mean, how dumb do you have to be to drop in on an active murder bot? And also, how convenient that he was shot on his shiny new armor. Mando is somehow surviving this. I will disengage. Self-destruct initiative. When did you ever engage it, though? You kept telling Mando you were about to, and then would do something else. Whoa, whoa, whoa there, Trigger Happy. You know your mark is in the room, and you want them alive. Perhaps it could live many centuries. Oh, it's Yoda! Look at him! Such a cute baby! Well, that means what? Is this Boba Fett? Sweet. I wonder how they'll tie in Luke and everything. Guys, I'm f***ing with you. Calm your rage before the dark side consumes you whole. Yeesh! Look where the leather meets the base of this shoe. One puddle in its funky foot for sure. Let's hope there's no rain or mud pits or anything. Well, sh What good are his eyelids if they don't close all the way? We know he can blink all the way. So, why go halfway? Have you ever tried to blink halfway? Do it now. It's really f***ing hard. Not to mention a horrible way to moisten the eyes. Mando just pushes the Porta Stroller and it shoots backward quicker than it had previously moved before coming to a complete stop. And yeah, yeah, we see him push doohickeys on his arm later to get it to move, but he's not doing that currently. It appears to be running on plot convenience. God, that child is so cute. Good thing Disney was prepared for the merch demands so that fans didn't have to buy adorably crafted fan art from independent artists who were filling a void. That would have led to so much red tape and countless cease and desist orders and worst of all it would disappoint artists and fans around the world. Glad that didn't happen. <laughs> Oh, come on, show. How are we supposed to believe any of this is real when faux Yoda doesn't have a chunk of enemy mine lizard running down his face? Expecting a child to stay put. I can't believe Mando missed the opportunity to kill two Jawas with one disintegration stone. That's where the saying comes from. What sort of bullets will evaporate an entire being with their weapons and clothing but leave the cloak behind for dramatic effect? I'm asking for a friend. I mean, sure, this seems like a really great time to test the range and speed of your wrist controller for the child pod. I've personally never been in a situation where I needed to shimmy up a metal fortress to dismantle a mobile scavenger society, but if I needed to do so, I'd opt for the slanty side rather than the sheer climb. I mean, why not use the zippy wrench lasso back here? Or hell, climb up the back where there are all sorts of things to grab onto. I'm just saying there appears to be a better way to get to the top of the faux fortress. Today, I learned that Jawas haul spare parts to the roof, so they're within easy reach for moments such as this. It's probably in a book or a blog that I don't have time to read. Man, I haven't seen this much Jawa murdering in a movie since Spaceballs 2, The Search for More Money. Just want to point out that our supposed badass Mandalorian, one of the toughest people in the Star Wars universe, was just outsmarted and defeated by f Jawas. Damn it, I really can't get away from how adorable this f creature is. Remove a sin, you cute little bastard. Walking. 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 Excitement? Also, I've watched this episode twice now, and I can confidently say it should be titled More Walking, because it's 26% fighting, 10% mud, 4% talking, 2% ship repair, 57% walking, and 1% eating frogs. I don't know who told them this was a great ratio for an episode of Star Wars, but they were wrong. This is what was causing all the fuss? I think it's a child. You might think that, Mando, but you know what happens when you assume? You make an ass out of you and not Baby Yoda, or something like that. The Jawas steal. They don't destroy. That is a super odd distinction and really hard to prove. In stripping down machinery, they could in fact destroy it, no? Hey, spit that out. A visual aid of how the Muppets were treated on Disney Plus makes its way into this episode. 
Also, kids. Did you know some people mow their lawns at night? It looks just like this, minus the rain. I've had two neighbors do this over the years and it baffles me to no end. I could maybe give a pass to one of them because his lawnmower had headlamps, but the other guy was pushing his push mower with one hand and using his smartphone flashlight with the other. Anyway, f nighttime mowing. Mow when you can see, Daryl. That's wookiest. Mando and the child are given prime seats at the helm? This man would be highly untrustworthy, so why place him in a position of power within the ship? I find it hard to believe Mando would be anywhere other than the cargo hold, or locked in the tiny Jawa bathroom. Behold the gaping sphincter. I mean, don't behold that much. If you stare at it too long, you'll question whether or not to penetrate. At this point, I'm not sure why you'd choose any other ammunition but the disintegration bullets. He's about to face off against a hairy berserker rhino from hell. Start with the pow fizzle bullets, and then the pew pew gun. How is leaving Green Machine outside the cave protecting it? Why wouldn't he leave it with Nick Nolte? Hell, the Jawas seem a safer bet than just leaving it out in the open like this when there are several people trying to kill it. Some people find this moment terrifying because of the rib bones, but I'm disgusted by this piss pond. I mean, it's either cave mud or monster piss, and honestly, both options are really disturbing to me. Oh, now you get out your poof poof gun. Also, we have now arrived at the portion of the show where the Mandalorian kills a mother to trade her egg for ship parts. You know, rather than hunt the Jawas in a smart way until he finds a way to kill them all. Retrieve his gear, plus the Jawa horde, and then head back home. This great warrior watches the massive horned beast approach, and rather than roll away, he hangs out and opts for a blowtorch arm, and he does it again a minute later. Will he ever learn? Not using the perfect opportunity to strike cliche, followed directly by the single strike insta-kill cliche. Also, I'm not saying one stab from that small blade couldn't kill it, but I am saying one stab from that small blade couldn't kill it. Once when I was a kid, I slept over at my great aunt's house and she had brown sticky shag carpeting that smelled like a cough syrup foot bath. I know this because I was designated to sleep on the floor. Anyway, I had a flashlight and when everyone went to bed, I was looking around and the light shone under the couch, which led me to discover that the carpet was actually teal, meaning the floor was so disgusting that it turned brown and I was essentially sleeping on 50 years of dead skin cells and life spills, all unwashed from a carpet that looks a lot like this. F that carpet. Even with a hairy outside coating, that still looks tastier than a Cadbury egg. This is going to take days to fix. That's what I thought. I mean, look at this thing earlier. It was right f***ed up. But nope, with a little can-do attitude, these two managed to get it ready for in-space flight overnight. Also, when did Mando heal after his fight? His ribs are barely in his body after this, and this, and this, or this, followed directly by this and a little side smack like this. But now, hours later, he's lifting ship parts back into place like he's not even sore? Nah, man. This is a super grandiose ending to an episode where not a thing of any interest happened. And yeah, yeah, the little green thing not named Yoda used the Force, but we've seen Star Wars, we know it can do this, so who gives a Trying to wake a sleeping baby. Is the wee one strapped in with a safety belt of some kind? Does the floaty pod dock in somehow? How do we know Baby Yodes is in there safely? I have no idea if he wants to eat it or hang it on his wall. Are there no other options? What if he wanted to raise it to be his green son? Or what if he wanted to study it? It's not a toy. Despite one fifth scale Yoda working his way into our hearts, I must stay vigilant and remind you that the sin here is and always will be kids. Well, yes, this pick up the kid by the scruff like an animal moment serves as a way to gauge Mando's eventual care of the child and the way he holds him differently by the end of the episode. It's still a horrible way to pick up a tiny kid. I mean, what is the point of this arch? Is it for show? Do people just walk under it because they can? Obviously they don't need to. And it doesn't look secure. Show reenacts my experience after eating baked goods at Coachella. Easy with that. You take it easy. Mando doesn't respond with stop copying me. Mando's Beskar boner is so powerful that he completely forgets that he kidnapped a child. Such a large bounty for such a small package. Such an odd thing to say when he's about to get snippy when Mando asks a question. Don't start small talk if you don't want small talk. Unfortunately, finding a Mandalorian in these trying times is more difficult than finding the steel. I find this really hard to believe. Mando straight up walks back to the Mandalorian den and reappears with super fancy armor. Anyone paying attention would be able to make the assumption that there are other Mandalorians not only out there, but nearby. Since the other Mandalorians can't go out and play, the writers have them all just milling about and fiddling with their armor, instead of enriching themselves with a game of strategy like Risk or Pass the Pigs. These envious Mandalorians showing up to the yard at the first hint of Mando's milkshake. I, I mean, best car. How can one be a coward if one chooses this way of life? So true! Imagine choosing a life where you can only use 10% of your field of vision by choice. Truly badass. 
Stop trying to convince me otherwise. Yes, I know some say it's ridiculous and should cripple any battle advantage, but stop it. It means they're brave. This is the way. But forget understanding any of the ways that the way is the way. I know I'm supposed to watch and enjoy and turn off my questioning mind, but I really wish I understood their code better. Is it the same as the guild code that Mando breaks to steal the kid in a moment? Why are there no apparent consequences for a fellow Lorian when he tries to rip off Mando's helmet? How do you choose the various options of armor add-ons? And is there a build your armor character creation screen? Since you forego a signet, I shall use the excess to forge whistling birds. Then honestly, why would anyone opt in for a signet when a sweet, sweet weapon like whistling birds is a choice? This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. One would expect this hammer banging flash backs position to provide some armor explanations. Instead, we get some backstory delivered completely out of context. Do you think it's a requirement to have a flashback to war trauma while the armor is cooked? And if so, why would anyone sit through this? I mean, why not get in and hide with your kid? But, but how did the robot without little digits on his hand actually open the door? You had your shot, dust breather, but you failed. That's respiracist? Using this walking into a saloon trope to remind us that this show isn't drawing inspiration from the Wild West so much as it's drawing inspiration from stereotypical movies about the Wild West. While we all love Mando's new shiny metal ass, walking in with your best car hanging out is about as subtle as a Tesla Cybertruck. And this level of bling seems to betray Mando's generally stoic demeanor. Take some time off. Enjoy yourself. Presuming you know when someone needs time off, which is especially concerning when you can't even read the person's expression to understand their state of mind. You're talking to a wall of armor. Stop telling it what to do. Also, considering Grief just told Mando that the entire place hates his guts, why would Mando want to stick around? Mando doesn't finish threading his shift knob onto the shaft. Acting as if you can do anything covertly when you've got this much shine. Staring at your dead comrade long enough to become dead yourself. Glad to see we're still sticking with shooting the control panel not only disables the lock, but also opens the door cliches. The medical guy looks up and sees that Mando has now removed baby greens from the medical device. I will never understand the level of confidence needed to do this without fear of harming the little one even more. You don't yank people off hospital beds. Mando's going back through this facility the long way? If the room he needed to get to was right by the outer wall, why not blast Puck through this outer wall in GTFO? I can see how Mando's helmet wasn't a disadvantage in this situation because every one of these idiots has one on. But the cape and sniper rifle on his back should have been detrimental during these close quarters fights. What kind of example does this set for the kids? I guess suddenly no one in the bad guy block seems to care about the kids surviving any longer. Do the stormtroopers know they're terrible at aiming so they shoot badly but confidently, therefore avoiding killing the child but also appearing as though they're defending their hideout? We now know that these whistling birds are rare, but why are they rare when they f***ing rule? If it's about the rarity of the metal, why not find a way to make them with other metals? And if they are so rare, why have an entire gauntlet designed to contain them only once every so often? Oddly, none of the explosions and gunfire brought any curious onlookers to the building. Earlier it was said that everyone had a tracking fob for the bounty on my Yoda from another mother. But they all kept the tracking fobs even after they found out Mando had already collected the bounty? Sure, some people are slow to throw things out, but the show wants us to believe that every last one of these ultra-absorbent assholes kept the thing. And that it's still active after the bounty was completed? Because I'm your only hope. <laughs> this just seems like a weird time for a callback to Princess Leia's message to Obi-Wan. Or is it not weird and the two moments are somehow connected? Well, either way, I was enjoying the show before that line, and now instead of enjoying the show, I'm thinking about possible reasons why Grief Karg is being a fanboy right now. Child Endangerment. Turning and running away in shame after realizing you brought an axe to a blaster fight. Drive. Backseat drivers. Exposing your tuning fork? Mando should know that when you realize your blasters in drop D while the rest of the firefight is in standard tuning, just take those shots a full step higher and get through it. That's one impressive weapon. A gun that vapes people? Yeah. Seems that the bullets for this weapon should be rarer than whistling birds, but no. In an interesting attempt to jump from the DCEU to the MCU, it looks like Mantis accidentally landed in the Star Wars canon. Did all the Mando people get the same ping message about Mando's sudden decision to go back on his bounty and take the kid? How did they know to show up? Okay, Disney, take all of my money. All of it. You're going to have to relocate the covert. Telling someone the reason why they shouldn't be helping you while they are helping you. Also, I'm pretty confident the whole Mandalorian group would have had a hard time hiding anyway. Mando got paid in Beskar, walked it through the street, and sauntered into their covert without any attempt at being sneaky, so anyone could go down the stairs and peek at the people. Wow, Grief boldly enters the ship with a gun aimed directly at Mando, yet somehow misses him even though he's now a slightly obscured shiny big guy standing in steam. Imagine being this horrible at aiming and choosing to face off with Mando one-on-one. -on -one. Idiot. 
Speaking of steam, there's a button on the ship that makes it pour out like this for why? Oh, good grief. Karga didn't die because of his Beskar plot armor. I gotta get one of those. Why? It's not like you're gonna use it properly. <laughs> Giving a metal ball to a child. I'm not sure whether it says more about the pointlessness of the previously on segments or the terrible action cutting, but I can't even tell the difference between this edited down action and the original cut to hell action. So let's go ahead and send both. DC Comics. I, I mean, Marvel. Uh, Comcast? I think the dark side of my sin brain is warring with my non-sin brain. <laughs> it's like my own personal Star Wars. Huh. Where'd I come up with those two words? Opening up your show with fishing. Might as well be opening it up on people attending church or a soccer match. It's as if the writers were like, how can we bore our viewers to the point of them wanting to scratch their eyes out right from the get-go? Also, these alien krill are about the brightest electric blue possible, which for an animal that's probably very tasty and easy to catch doesn't make a lot of evolutionary sense. If only Darwin had space travel and lived in the distant past, we could have avoided all of this. This is terrible frog catching technique. Everyone knows you have to catch from the top front of the frog, not the back. Then you hold it gently by the sides while it relieves itself as a defense mechanism, at which point you let it go because you can't stand the thought of terrorizing a small animal. It's like in the frog catching manual and everything. <laughs> Take that woven gourd shaped object. Droid murder. Droider? Only on movies and TV do people absolutely terrified of death from an intruder stop hiding immediately after the bad guy leaves. It's not like they were suffocating under there. Those two would have stayed underneath that basket for another five minutes at least before slowly raising it up and sneaking away. But sure, let's go with the violently discard safety while the bad guy's still likely an earshot strategy. Not completing your A's. Those are upside down V's, Disney. Upside down consummate V's. Stop touching things. <laughs> But also, kids. No population density. Real backwater skug hole. That's skuggist. What, you don't know what a skug is? Consider your ignorance part of the problem. Go educate yourself. You ready to lay low and stretch your legs for a couple of months, you little womp rat? Either Mando has a sense of humor or he doesn't. Show plays so fast and loose with his emotional output, I've got worse whiplash than a bolator playing with a high-low ball. You stay right here. You stay. Attempting to leave minors alone in a parked vehicle. <laughs> Not keeping your bat your chicken leg pug cat in check. And yes, I know it has an actual name, but my version is more accurate and you know it. Well, you're in luck. I just took down a Gringer, so there's plenty. Oh, a Gringer, you say? Well, I'm certain we all know what that is and how it'd be taken down by you, so we fully understand what all of this means. Look, if there's one thing I'm consistent about, it's that these shows need more exposition. Sheesh. Keep an eye on the kid. Yes, sir. Not vetting your baby Yoda sitters. Next thing you know, a Ghostbuster's doing some housework for you and catches her breastfeeding the little guy and it's all downhill from there. I know how this stuff works. What on earth, I mean, what on Sorgan is this scanning for? Can't be heat, right? Because there's no way this amount of heat would still be left after brief walking contact with a shoe. And if it's just looking for indentations in the ground, couldn't you do that with the naked eye? Perhaps the show wants us to believe it's some mystical microbial remnant that's on the bottom of everyone's shoes that Mando can scan. But it's clearly playing it to look like some sort of heat signature remnant, so I'll send it on the confusion alone. <laughs> helmet punching will always be a sin, but when it's Beskar helmet punching, I'm going with five. Both combatants pull their guns to shoot, but then don't for some reason cough, cough, plot armor, cough, cough, and then just hold the guns in a pointless standoff. Cliche. Cute moment, but how did Grogu get down from the chair with the porridge? Mando had to pick him up and put him in the chair when they got to the establishment. Let's just call it an early retirement. Call it whatever you want, Gina. I mean, Kara. Unless you want to go another round. One of us is going to have to move on, and I was here first. Why is this, though? The whole reason Kara and Mando picked this place is because it's not on anyone's radar. So what does it matter if both of them are there? This feels like unnecessary conflict, which makes it very necessary to award a sin. To the middle of nowhere. Where do you live? I could send that this information is enough to change Mando's firm no to a yes, but instead I'm going to send the phrase middle of nowhere. There is no middle of nowhere. In fact, there is no nowhere. Do you know where nowhere is? Your line is, nowhere. Let's try that again. Do you know where nowhere is? Nowhere is just a small separation away from now here. My point is Mando is wishy-washy. Good thing Mando knew exactly in the woods where Kara was and it was close by. Convenient future work buddy camping site is convenient. Damn it, Grogu. You basically have no relevance to this episode, but Disney's using you as some get out of boring free card by just throwing in your unrelenting cuteness every once in a while, even though it has nothing to do with this discount hidden fortress episode. I'm not saying it isn't working. I'm just saying it's unfair. Mando has lightning speed reflexes here and almost shoots this little girl, but earlier didn't even turn around when the two villagers rode up to him at the Razor Crest. Nor did he even notice Grogu was approaching him until he was standing right next to Mando before they went into the village. Is it the helmet or just plot selective peripheral vision? Can I feed him? 
I give all the sins back if right after he says yes, she quickly finishes her sentence with to the mama core as a ritual sacrifice. I don't think they'll be fine. Oh, sure. Leaving me in the ship alone or with a random Gringer murderer is fine. But the second a little girl wants a play date, he goes straight into Fluttercraft parenting mode. Let us know if there's anything you need. She 100% wants his Beskar spear and he's not even going to react. I get all the this is the way stuff, but he only has to leave the helmet on, right? Do Mandalorians take a vow of celibacy? I don't care about the answer. I will not be denied Rando Mando. Wait, what? He can take that off in front of an open window with kids playing right outside? How is this not the Mandalorian version of indecent exposure? About 15 or 20 of them came through here on foot. But when? If they're tracking where the crew of raiders headed that attacked the village a couple of days ago, these heat signatures would have easily cooled off by now. Bullsh** technology continues to be bullsh**. And something big sheared off those branches. You think? Did your fancy exposition vision help you with that brilliant insight? We're not leaving. Stubbornness. Sure, in movies and TV it always seems to somehow work, but in real life you just end up tearing a rotator cuff when the jar of pickles won't budge, but you refuse to use the hairdryer trick your girlfriend found on the internet. These people should end up dead. Or at least eating pickles one-handed. We're gonna need to dig real deep. Right here. Car and Mando will proceed to talk about this trap along with the need to cut down trees and build barricades with them. Not to mention they have to train a group of farmers how to be combat ready. These are tasks that would probably take at least a week if not longer to complete, but I have to assume only takes a day or two. And if we're supposed to believe that a week or two has passed, then the village got extremely lucky they weren't raided again. Either way, I'm pretty sure there's some bullshit in here to send somewhere. Also, this episode spends as much time on its training montage as a two hour movie like Shang-Chi, and we don't even get an Aquafina miracle kill shot out of it. Great work. Your combination of braggadocio, arrogance, and propensity for wasting ammo is going to come in real handy later when your tribe runs out of shots because you decided to kill that pan 20 times. America! Radioactive milk. This grapples on incoherently for some time. If Kara was correct earlier and the villagers already knew about the ATSD, then how were any of these trees that it's currently taking down still standing? Look, there are plenty of parts of this plan that are pure bantha shit and should never work, but this part actually should. There's no way the driver of this thing got this close to the trap and then mid-step looked down and figured it out. I'd believe it if he had spotted it a ways out, but this timing is clearly meant to drive up the tension, not the reality. Get down! Get down! Starting a cool in the gang song without getting to the jungle boogie part. Also, even though everyone was told to get down, Caban and Stoke are still raised up and deserve to die, but won't. So what exactly was the plan before Cara Dune, but not that Dune, went up and shot the eye out of the ATSD? If it had stepped into the water originally, was Mando just going to run up there and try a bomb on the outside of the head? It's gonna break his little heart. Strumming the shrimp with their fingers, singing wildlife with their words, krilling him softly with this song, krilling him so- He'll get over it. We all do. Parental abandonment? Oh yeah, that's an easy thing to get over. I mean, wait, what? I will look after him as one of my own. For the next 50 or 60 years, at which point I'll die and he will still be a toddler. But I totally got this. Dunus Ex Machina. The surest way to know you're watching quality Star Wars these days is when you see these five beautiful words at the end of the episode. Instead of this, we get this. It's against the guild code. Show stops mid previously on to confirm that we are, in fact, watching a previously on. Look, if your previously on needs an intermission, it might be too long. Believing that spinning this fast and the associated nausea will make you a better shooter. It's frankly ridiculous how little the Razor Crest is hit, and even more ridiculous that it survives the few occasions when it does take a direct hit, which is made even more especially ridiculous when the other bounty hunter ship is destroyed with the first shot. Bring you in warm, or I can bring you in cold. This version of the I can bring you in dead or alive cliche lacks clarity, and could be misinterpreted as I can bring you in with or without a cardigan. That's my line. Fine, you get a sin for it as well. This man's scream echoes in space. This is Moss Eisley Tower. Yay. Tatooine. Again. Seriously though, what are the odds that Mando gets into a fight close enough to a planet that he can crash land on, let alone one that can sustain life, and also just happens to be tattoo forcing in again? I suppose the sheer weight of fan service is enough to increase the Sandy Ball's gravitational pull far beyond the expected norm. Mando's a dick to the prequels. You damage one of my droids, you'll pay for it. Just keep them away from my ship. Joe has apparently chosen droidist discrimination as the best way to give Mando some edge. Oof. Look at that. Mechanics. These maintenance droids are cheating. So not only have they been uselessly programmed with the ability to play a card game, but also how to cheat and the benefits that come with winning. I'm just saying that I feel like this is a slippery slope to we don't need the squishy meat sacks anymore and probably shouldn't be allowed. 
the Bounty Guild no longer operates in Tatooine. You're looking for work. Have a seat, my friend. Mando and Cala can both luck out in extraordinary fashion here. Mando manages to get work despite the guild not having a presence on Tatooine, and Calican manages to get a freaking Mandalorian land in his lap to help him with his quest. How long did Calican plan on hanging around? And what would Mando have done if Calican wasn't relying on dumb luck in this bar's reputation to catch Finnick? Think again, Tin Can. Show has apparently chosen droidist discrimination as the best way to give Calican some edge. Fennec Shand is an elite mercenary. If you go after her, you won't make it past sunrise. You can keep the money, all of it. Somehow, knowing that he'll get all of an undisclosed bounty instead of half of an undisclosed bounty is enough to convince Mando that catching Finnick is now a thing that can happen. And give me the tracking fob. Don't worry. I got it all memorized. But the tracking fobs are tracking Finnick as she moves, right? And if they're not, then they're totally f***ing useless anyway. If Calican or the fob is working from one set of coordinates, then Finnick could easily double back and then the two of them are just going to be walking around the desert like a couple of assholes. And I've seen quite enough of the Book of Boba Fett already, thank you. Being surprised that your child went missing after leaving the front f***ing door wide open. What'd you expect? Corellia. I'd Google what Corellia is, but if anyone'd like to give me a hand, that would be great. I'm getting fed up tracking all of this solo. The fast and the forciest. All this speeder bike action really highlights just how much of this episode is a celebration of being in transit. I'm not just sending that these fobs do most of the heavy lifting in the bounty game, like telling you where to go and how close you are, but it's also that it might be more fun to watch Mando track the targets with skill and cunning as opposed to Google Maps. Hit me in the best car. And at that range, best car held up. The statement is redundant, because later on the armor will also hold up at close range. Regardless, I'm still confused as to why Finnick isn't going for the squishy bits between Mando's literal plot armor. You see where that shot came from? Yeah, it came from that ridge. The specificity of that ridge really doesn't cut it when you follow up with this shot of all the ridges. This is only about 10% more helpful than saying that way without putting any hands up. If you have to remove your signature helmet in order to use your signature weapon, might I suggest that one or both of these two signatures may need rethinking? Finnick distracts Toro with a throwing knife to the blaster, then has enough time to run and kick said blaster away despite having a f***ing gun. Yes, it's a long-range weapon, but I've played enough video games to know that being no-scoped with a sniper rifle is just as likely to work and 1,000% more infuriating. It looks like you got off easy. Thinking that having a new suit means that a person hasn't been through some shit. Looks like one of us has to walk. Or we could drag you. He can't really do that because of plot reasons, but it's definitely a viable option, and if the show wasn't going to use it, then it really shouldn't have brought it up. Watch her. And don't let her get near the bike. There is no reason for Mando to take the risk of leaving Fennec alone with Calican here when the show has gone to great lengths to show us that they're fully capable of walking through sand for extended lengths of time. Bringing you in will make me a full member of the Bounty Hunters Guild. 28 minute episode chooses to repeat information we already have. It's called the Mandalorian, not the over explain every plot point, Ian. Fennec survives this. If the Mandalorian's worth more than you are, well. Who wouldn't want to be a legend? But also, why doesn't he want Finnick to survive this? Regardless of how much the bounty on Mando is worth, there's still money to be made from taking in Finnick. Take her in, get the bounty, tell them where Mando is, and then boom, double the legendary. Why is Calican holding the blaster on Mando? Mando doesn't care about being shot, and he'll probably think twice about any sudden moves if the blaster stays trained on the adorably squishy piece of product placement Calican is holding. Necrostelia. I hear spurs, but I do not see spurs. What's this? The pedestrian equivalent of pumping fake engine noise through your speakers? Also, we're supposed to be rooting for Mando, but he just assumes Finnick is dead without checking, which leads to this scene, which in turn leads to five full episodes of Boba Fett. Thanks, Mando. The Razor Crest is still in one piece in this scene. Yes, I'm sending the show because it will eventually blow up this beautiful beast, and I know you feel that pain too. Mando. Is that you under that bucket? Ah, sudden Bobby Elvis. Also, what a weird way to address someone who, in theory, you've only ever seen while they were wearing said bucket. Unless, of course, this is one more person Mando has unsheathed himself in front of, in which case he really should think about amending his oath to this is the way, when it's convenient to me. You know the policy. No questions. This seems like an extremely broad and frankly unrealistic policy. Let's see how long it lasts. So what's the job? <laughs> Eight seconds. <laughs> The ship wasn't part of the deal. Yeah, the crest is the only reason I let you back in here. Hey, what happened to... And you? You're welcome back here anytime. My goodness, I know we're dealing with criminals here, but is an ounce of consistency too much to ask for people? What's the look? Asking someone who's wearing a full face helmet about the look they're giving them. Bilber's not the first person that would pop in most people's heads as the badass slash sharpshooter on a heist team. <laughs> However, I'm glad he was on the minds of the Mando team because he's great in this role former Imperial sharpshooter. That's not saying much. 
I wasn't a stormtrooper, wise ass. Wait, so it's known in universe that stormtroopers can't hit the broadside of a bantha, and yet they're still being used? I can't believe that thing can fly. It's like a Canto Bite slot machine. How does that look anything like a slot machine? Hello, Mando. Xion. One member of the team is a woman who has a long history with the protagonist cliche. This is shiny. Invading a Mandalorian's personal space and touching their armor with your blade without explicit consent. You're gonna be okay, sweetheart? Calling someone you're not in a relationship with, sweetheart. Tiny. <laughs> Ooh, nice insult, Pet Cemetery 2's Clancy Brown. <laughs> Excited to see what else you might have up your sleeve later. Although, if you pull off a good your mom, I'll forgive the tiny reference. Fuel navigation. Hyperdrive. Excitement? Your man wasn't taken by a rival syndicate. He was arrested. A job is a job. Yes, and eating Legos is eating Legos. Repeating things doesn't make them a good idea. And I'm not looking for that kind of heat. But you had no issue parking your ride on a station with a former criminal colleague. If we immediately bank into this kind of attitude, we should be right in that blind spot. <laughs> this thing is brand new, top of the line, and not to mention f***ing huge, but still has an enemy ship has an easily exploitable blind spot cliche built right in. Who is building these things? Kids. Also, this compartment filled with weapons isn't locked. Surely a no-brainer when there's a band of untrustworthy, ruthless mercenaries on board. Apparently, they're the greatest warriors in the galaxy. Then why are they all dead? Berg would be Darth Revan at TV Sins. He never takes off the helmet. This is the way. Blasphemy. <laughs> this compartment filled with Baby Yoda isn't locked. Surely a no-brainer when there's a band of untrustworthy... You get the idea. It's impressive that this gunship has survived the Empire. This episode is 17% characters talking sh** about Mando's ship. Is Zeon's specialty really just knives? I mean, this would be of questionable value versus an organic crew with guns, but it's downright idiotic against an entirely metal crew with guns. Why is Berg even here? I don't care if he's the muscle, if he isn't smart enough to realize that prematurely pew-pewing a harmless droid that's likely linked to the deadly droids isn't a good idea, then I'd happily carry the damn heavy things myself. How is the backpack blaster activated? How does it know what to aim for or when to fire? When will I stop trying to make sense of any of the tech in Star Wars? Not today! Get that blaster out of my face, Mando! This Mandalorian standoffs for some time. Sure, Berg's got big muscles, but any droid that can be taken down this easily by Discount Hellboy here really has no place being assigned to a maximum security ship. You deserve this! But why? What are they gaining from throwing Mando in the prison? Vengeance? There's no profit in vengeance. And surely they know their odds are significantly improved if he's still with them. Fortunately for Mando, this arm still works, despite being disconnected from its power source and the AI that controls it. I can't tell if these are the computer graphics being displayed on the ship's computer, or if Zero is in the middle of a game of Tron Deadly Discs on his Intellivision. It seems comms are no longer functioning. Comms go down in the middle of a dangerous mission cliche. And yeah, maybe I've laid on the cliche sins a little thick, but that's only because this episode is as well. Whatever Ran promised, I'll see to it you get triple share. You better be good for it. <laughs> I mean, I'd probably take that laugh to mean something like, what do you think, dickhead? You just broke me out of prison and all I have is this vest and a pair of lovely head calves. Of course I'm not good for it. But you trust who you want to trust, Mayfeld. Mando. Polo? Berg survives this. These look like the same droids from earlier, so why are they going down so much easier this time around? Were those previous droids on special roids to help avoid the weapons being deployed? Or am I doomed to be an annoyed humanoid screaming into a void devoid of joy? I mean, joy. Okay, when did this f***er turn into James Wan's The Mandalorian? I did the job. Yeah, you did. So Ranzar was essentially full of sh** when he said that... It's a five-person job. Right? Because it quickly became abundantly apparent that this was, in fact, a one maybe two-person gig, including the robot. Mando does the vast majority of the droid control, while the others seem to be actively sabotaging the mission at every opportunity. Not only does Mando retrieve the prisoner alone, but he does it while facing three additional opponents that weren't even in the original brief. Kill him. Why kill him after he's taken your money? It's not like he's any less dangerous inside the spaceship with lasers. Um, guys? If the tracking beacon was activated as a distress call, isn't it at least possible that it's still being held by the poor bastard that sent the message? Yes, I know we were told earlier that this beacon would result in immediate destruction, but when did shoot first and rescue the charred remains of the dead hostages later become the Republic's standing orders? You know the policy. No questions. 
So what's the job? This is the guy? What did he get out of it? You remember what you said, Mando? We did some crazy stuff, didn't we? Don't take long, does it? Why are we using this one? Why are they all dead? Is he as good as they say? He never takes off the helmet. You ever seen his face? What is that? You get lonely up here, buddy? Did you two make that? What is it, like a pet or something? Is that true, Mando? We always paranoid. You didn't think we need to know that tiny little detail? Are you questioning my managerial style, Sion? Do you have a name? Is it now your code? On to a man of honor. Where are the others? No questions asked. That's the policy, right? Such a large bounty for such a small package. Reminding us of the previous episode where Werner Herzog broke into gigolo jokes for no apparent reason. Also, there's no reason why a previously on bit needs to be over a minute long. This is a TV show, not a Lord of the Rings movie. The previously on before the two towers didn't even last. There was none because previously ons are dumbing down of storytelling comprehension skills, you bastards. Not having a proper car seat. Sorry, razor crest seat for your child. Seriously, we know you're not the most successful bounty hunter, but you can afford a quick stop at whatever the galaxy's equivalent of Target is to buy your child some proper protective seating, or just shop at the actual Target. You'll be safe there. Stormtroopers can't get anywhere near it. My friend, if you are receiving this transmission, that means you are alive. You might be surprised to hear this, but I am alive too. Look, Grief, most of this could be gleaned from the context of your message. I misplaced a college friend one time after a wild night of too much scrabble, but their text in the morning asking if I wanted to get breakfast was more than enough to establish that they were alive and thought that I was alive as well. You kill him, and we both get what we want. Oh, cool, you're alive. Sorry about trying to kill you the other day. Hey, can you do me a favor? If that fire rope thing connecting them doesn't burn or do anything besides function as a rope, why wouldn't you just use a rope? Save your poor special effects intern from having to edit this pointless thing into the scene through multiple cuts. Hey, I'm mud scuffers. Mud scuffers. I know we all got a good kick out of Nerf Herder, but maybe we can stop trying to make other funny words happen. It's not going to happen. You've got like three different groups of people looking for your baby. Can you at least attempt to keep him hidden? The kid will never be safe until the imp is dead. Shortening Imperial to imp, which is a mythical creature and would change the Star Wars universe in a way fans wouldn't be happy with. Ha, <laughs> who are we kidding? Star Wars fans are never happy. See, this is what happens when you leave a child unattended in another room. It's either they take over your ship's steering console or they make soup in the toilet by pouring in all the spices in the cabinet and then take turns drinking it. They do that sometimes, I've heard. You got anyone you can trust? The uncanny probability that the person he trusts will be on a desert planet. I've worked in the gene farms. This one looks evolved, too ugly. That's eugenist. Would anyone care for some tea? Disney Plus refuses to give us a spinoff based around Taika Watidroid. Not anymore. He couldn't have let him know that he had a bounty hunter droid before it strolled into the room getting their tea order? I found it laying where it fell. Well, someone might have moved the Robocorp, so you're just assuming it fell there. Also, not knowing how to properly use laying and lying. My ninth grade English teacher didn't grammar shame me in front of the entire class just for you to trigger me like this. I recovered the flotsam. Well, someone might have deliberately left the Robocorps there, so you're just assuming it's not Jetsam. It had to learn everything from scratch. This is something that cannot be taught with a twist of a spanner. Maybe not a spanner, but certainly with a software update. And I'm sure this Robo Karate Kid scenario will be important to the plot at some point. But considering the other they've got going on right now, I don't know why Quill thinks Mando and Kara have time for this. Tea. Taking a drink that was clearly offered to Mando instead of waiting patiently for your own cup. Manners matter, Cara Dune. In fact, here's another two sins for poor table manners. My teacher in finishing school didn't teabag shame me in front of the entire class for you to trigger me like this. I can pay you handsomely, Ugnot. Referring to the man who helped you get your stolen parts back, rebuild your spaceship from scratch, and gave you tea as his species name. Why are everyone's manners in this galaxy so awful? None will be free until the old ways are gone forever. And yet the sequel trilogy tells us the old ways don't disappear. Somehow they returned. While Queel sits down on the ship to do bong rips, I have to wonder how much more interesting it would have been to get a glimpse into his past instead of clips where he's teaching a robot to walk and make tea. Uh. Casual attempted murder. What? When you work for the Empire? This tension between Kara and Queel gets written into the scene as if they didn't have a cordial tea party before and as if he was the one choking her. Grogu is the one being an ass here. Let's not forget that. Making me watch other people watch this ship land. It appears that introductions are in order. 
It seems we've both provided a security detail. Did the writers run out of dialogue for this scene and decide that grief verbalizing his observations was a good substitute? There's meeting outside of town to avoid alerting the Imperial troops, and then there's meeting so far out of town that it requires a camping trip. And while I hate camping as much as everyone else, the real issue is that nothing has been established to make the long night of Stand By Me portion of the episode feel necessary. Nothing can go wrong. And now we have some sort of pterodactyl dragon situation putting us somewhere between Jurassic World and Pitch Black. Why is this contrived scene trying to be all of the things? This little guy truly does not care that he's about to be eaten by a space dragon. The poison's spreading fast. Those things were poisonous too? This scene has more random tension than the time I saw my friend John start a fight with a car seat and lose. He's trying to eat me. He is not. But at this point, I'm kind of surprised the writers didn't take it in that direction. There's that mysterious force healing ability again. And once more, force ghost Qui-Gon looks on before walking away muttering, that is such bullshit. I need your eyes. Don't take her eyes. She needs those to see and protect you. Unless you think she can be Donnie Yen. <laughs> Listen, Mando, I saw Donnie Yen. I had my mind blown by Donnie Yen. And she is no Donnie Yen. There's something you should know. That's just one step removed from a you better come take a look at this cliche and we'll let Cindy decide if that's far enough to avoid a sin. What do you say, buddy? Well, there you have it. Also, let's talk about how useless that armor was. He got shot once in the upper left corner and died instantly. Who made this armor? Was it the same designer that makes useless stormtrooper armor? Is there a guild of armor makers in this galaxy far, far away that consistently releases inferior products? Nothing on this planet will breach those doors. Hold on there, partner. Nothing on the planet will breach those doors? Jawas were able to tear your ship apart in just one day in a previous episode. We've seen how flimsy the Razor Crest is, so maybe think before you go around jinxing the ship's whole integrity. That's how you get an iceberg to sink your ship. Arm wrapping! Gratuitous blaster close-ups! Looking deep into the eyes of a baby! Excitement? I give you 20 credits for the helmet. I don't know what the exact exchange rate is for Beskar, but this asshole trying to grift out on the edge of the Republic sucks way more than I would expect it grifting. On your wall. Go with it. Pretending the guards can't hear you say this even though you're six inches apart. Can I offer you a libation? to celebrate the closing of our shared narrative. Pre-maturation celebration libations. The empire improves every system it touches. Camino and Alderaan have entered the chat. I see nothing but death and chaos. I would like to see the baby. Werner Herzog wanting to see a baby. Have they brought the child? Yes, I have. Currently it is sleeping. You may want to check again. Moff the boss buries the lead before burying this blaster beam in the client as a dramatic show of Imperial force. Instead of saying, yeah, man, hate to bum you out, but they don't have the kid. You probably should try to kill them. Just saying, if we briefly suspend our disbelief in their plot armor, there is some chance the client succeeds in killing them and Moff's job is that much easier. I hate it when villains work harder and not smarter. Are you there? Do you copy? Yes. Mando f***s over Queel so hard right here by doing this over unsecured comms that I'm willing to simply sin him for being a dick. Back to the ship and bail. Get the kid out of here. We're pinned down. Wait, are we supposed to believe Queel was dumb enough to give Mando a communicator set to the same frequency as the stormtroopers were using? Because that seems like a pretty big oversight. Even if the stormtroopers intercepted the radio transmission, how do they know where Mando's ship is? Is it because the writers told them? It is, isn't it? Well, guess what our writers told Cinny to do? I love when they let the ships and other elements in the world shine so we can see all the tech and take in all the hard work that went into the creation and depiction of these works of art. But this episode has done it so much that they've ended up developing the spacecraft in blurgs more than the characters. Worst jack-in-the-box ever. These stormtroopers all stand here with their weapons aimed like most of them are going to shoot one of their buddies in the back of the head. You have something I want. You may think you have some idea of what you are in possession of, but you do not. Giancarlo Esposito is such a wonderfully terrifying villain. Once in removed for Gus Fring. I mean, Moff Gideon. Quiddle, are you there? Do you copy? Not having the guts to show such a heart-wrenching death on screen. Quill deserved better. I have spoken. It's math time, everybody. Are we ready for the sequation of the day? Yeah! All right. What do you get when you add one minute and 24 seconds of previously ons to 24 seconds of logos? That's right, kids. Sins. Yeah! 
Knock it off. I get that these guys are assholes, but you tell me that this literal child abuse didn't give you all of the uncomfortable winces, and I will call you a liar. Or the police. It's right on the galaxy's edge of being too fan y but these two are hilarious together, and I can't help but remove a sin for this, ironically, on-target gag. Any update yet? Considering the kill-to-death ratio of your typical stormtrooper, I'm not sure why these guys are in such a hurry to end their rather cushy collect Moff Gideon's lunch and enjoy the view assignment. You just killed an officer for interrupting him. I understand killing a trooper or two to make a point and flex your power, but at some point it just seems wasteful. If the Empire is gone, aren't stormtroopers in limited supply? Maybe just render a few of them unconscious to make your point? Resource management is important. The last thing that you want is to give Gideon a bag and have him open it up and find whatever is Okay, left. okay, look. Yeah, but you're now robbing us of the opportunity for these guys to get into a weekend at Giddy's situation with a dead Grogu. A pet? Star Wars continues to prove just how useless Stormtrooper armor is. He's wearing thick gloves, and yet Grogu's tiny teeth were somehow powerful enough to hurt his fingers. Stop punching your boss's new child slash pet slash lunch. I'd require that you remind him to me immediately. Are you refusing my request? No, I'm telling you to get out of here. Sounds an awful lot like you're refusing IG-11's request to me. What the hell are they waiting for? Should the characters in the Star Wars universe have a concept of hell? Sure, Anakin apparently knows what an angel looks like, but that's not explained either. Listen, vocabulary matters. Just because this is a common phrase on our planet doesn't mean it would be here too. So just give her something different to say. Or make them swear in Mandarin like Firefly did. They're setting up an e-web. Oh no, not an e-web. How the hell will they ever escape the e-web? The f is an e-web? It's over. Reef Karga goes all Hudson from Aliens on us, and if this weapon is that powerful, I suppose he has a point. I mean, there's no way Moff Gideon would do something outrageous like give them an entire day before... I will give you until nightfall. Moffer, f***er. I found the sewer vent. Why would you have a vent to a sewer directly behind a bench where people would sit and drink? I have a hard time believing anyone would sit in a bar that smells like a sewer. Where do you think you are? New York City? Blow it. I'm out of charges. Says the script. Members of my escort have completed assembly of an E-Web heavy repeating blaster. Okay, I couldn't help but research what this is, and it turns out it's a pretty badass piece of gear that was used in The Empire Strikes Back. Cool. Nice callback. However, its full title is Emplacement Weapon Heavy Blaster, which means Moff is pulling a pin number by calling it an Emplacement Weapon Heavy Blaster Heavy Repeating Blaster. Stop shortening things and then saying the words you've already shortened. Or perhaps the decommissioned Mandalorian Hunter. Din Djarin. Villain full names the heroes he's trapped and goes through their history as a way of asserting dominance cliche. Or as we say in the biz, Hans Grubering. I will give you until nightfall, and then I will have the E-Web cannon open fire. Seriously, why do villains always do this? All he's doing is giving them time to escape. If he really wants to force their hand, he should give them two minutes to surrender, not several hours. I understand the writers need to give our heroes a way to escape into season two, but there are smarter ways to do that. They'll upload me to a mind player. As long as you put enough points into your intelligence stat, you should be fine, Kara. You only need a DC 15 intelligence saving throw to avoid its mind blast attack. And even if you fail and get stunned, you get to reroll that saving throw at the end of each turn. Trust me, 5e mind flayers aren't nearly as bad as they used to be in 3.5e. Uh, or that's what some nerd told me. <laughs> yeah, f***ing nerds, am I right? <laughs> it's Moff Gideon. No. Moff Gideon was executed for war crimes. How do these pretty regular-looking stormtroopers talk about Moff Gideon as if he's the poster Sith for what's left of the Empire? But Mando revealing his identity comes as a huge shock to Kara and Karga. Mandalorian isn't a race. It's a creed. Roll comer? Huh. Sorry about that, everyone. That really felt like a Roll Commercials moment. I guess I'll just send it for breaking the fourth wall, because if there wasn't a helmet in the way, Pedro Pascal would be staring directly into the camera for that line. This flashback's position of civilians being killed goes on for all of the some time. We get it. The Empire sucks. Sheesh. Uh-oh. If Twister taught me anything, it's that when a kid is put in a basement, the father's going to die. I'm starting to get the feeling Din's parents aren't walking away from this one. And for clarity, I meant the movie, Twister, not the game. Although, come to think of it, the game would work too. Electric guitar riff of justice. Also, looks like we've got a kid whose name rhymes with in hides underground while Imperial baddies kill their parents until they're rescued by future mentor cliche. Okay, maybe that's not a cliche, but the similarities to Rogue One seem unnecessary in a galaxy full of potential origin stories. Cool shot, but there are still plenty of droids around. Could they really afford to dramatically unfold their hand and wait for Din to climb out? 
Moff Gideon was an ISB officer during the purge. That's how I know it's him. What kind of proof is that? How can he know Moff was the only ISB officer connected to Mandalore? Why is it only an ISB officer that could know his name? <laughs> Look, I'm sure there's something I'm missing here, but I wish someone would tell me exactly what, because Karga and Kara take this as unquestioning proof that Moff Gideon is, well, Moff Gideon. He says he needs us, which means the child got away safely. I was worried when the Ugnat didn't respond. Stop calling this person you've come to implicitly trust and respect by their species. You don't call Kara the human or Luke the ungodly CGI rendering of my nightmares. Okay, I know that's not until season two, but it bears sinning as much as possible. I am fulfilling my base function. Which is? To nurse and protect. Not that the shots of Grogu laughing while IG-11 blows shit up aren't awesome, but if your directive is to nurse and protect, wouldn't you take the child further away from danger? Running the kid into an active conflict zone would seem to violate that directive pretty fundamentally, especially when the Razor Crest was an option. Punching a guy in metal laser proof armor. Only members of the Bad Batch could get away with that nonsense. Mando rips the E-Web off of its mount, presumably so that he can make it a mobile vessel of pewing fury. But since he ends up standing in the same spot and spinning around, why didn't he just leave it on the mount with its stability intact and save himself a copyright lawsuit from the Master Chief? I know stormtroopers aren't exactly the masters of tactical warfare, but this dickhead literally runs toward the line of fire created by the super powerful death cannon. Why are they still trying to get into the bar? Both Mando and Grogu are clearly outside on the street. And you might say, but TV sins taking the bar offers a tactical advantage. And we'd say, stuff it, you scruffy nerf herders. Stormtroopers aren't that smart. Like and subscribe. Yes, stormtroopers couldn't hit the broadside of a bantha, but shouldn't the priority here be taking out the extremely exposed car and Mando? We barely see a shot even come near them. I mean, what the hell is Moff Gideon doing right now? Washing his tights? Wait, what? Didn't they just blow the door off with a f***ing grenade? How is it all fixed and properly shutting now? What kind of a bar has a reloading door? I'm not gonna make it. Go. Trying to convince the audience that the show's titular character will die when season two has already been ordered and sinned. I'm gonna need to take this thing off. No. You leave me. Codes of Honor are cool and all, but the Mandalorians are basically an endangered species right now. If taking the helmet off can let her save his life, then do it. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. This is the way, and I have spoken. But that's not gonna matter all that much in about five minutes when a droid finds a loophole as small and ridiculous as a midichlorian. When you get to the Mandalorian covert, you show them that. Do you want to tell your friends where the top secret covert is before you kick the bucket? They'll probably need directions. Guys, we want to make sure the stormtrooper looks different because they have a flamethrower and shit. Any suggestions? Um, how about some unsettling red paint that makes it look like the skin of his helmet is being pulled back to reveal a fleshy undermaw? Ugh, that's gross, and it doesn't say flame trooper to me. I love it! Let me have a warrior's death. We just saw Grogu use force healing powers in the last episode to save Grief Cargus, so why can't they do the same thing for Din here? Is someone saving their force powers for a more dramatic scene? Are they? I bet they are. I bet they are. I won't leave you. She will. At this point, we've had so many Deus Grogugunas that it's hard to buy into the stakes of these near-death situations. It's especially baffling when you realize that a matter of hours ago, Grogu chose not to use their powers to save Queel, a character we like more than at least 50% of the people in this room. No living thing has seen me without my helmet since I swore the creed. I am not a living thing. I'm truly conflicted about the helmet removal. I'm all for seeing Pedro Pascal, but doesn't this feel a little unearned? Yes, it's debatable as to whether IG-11 is truly alive, but that doesn't feel like an argument that's going to hold up in Mando Court. And spoilers for season two, it doesn't. It's almost like the show just felt bad for not showing us Pedro. Like, we know this could have been anybody in the suit with Pedro in a recording booth, but we want to show you that he put the armor on at least once. Never mind that it undermines one of the character's core f***ing beliefs. This is a back to spray. It will heal you in a matter of hours. Back to spray? Back to spray? That sh comes in a spray form? Every time we've seen it used, Bacta is kept in a tank and the character has to be submerged to benefit from its miraculous healing properties. Someone should tell Boba Fett so he doesn't waste half of his series just napping in a fishbowl dreaming of electric exposition. Also, you're only mentioning this now? This asshole listen to Kara and Mando argue instead of saying, I've managed to bottle the essence of plot convenience and can fix whatever we need to fix so there's really no need to get all emotional and sh also, episode two, Attack of the Also. If the Bacta Spray is that powerful, why did you need to remove the f***ing helmet? Just spray that shit under there and leave the man with his honor. I can stand. I'll try to find tracks. We're close. And looking at the ground was somehow a physical impossibility while leaning on Kara and looking at the ground. The songs of Eon's past tell of battles between Mandalore the Great and an order of sorcerers called Jedi. 
that fought with such powers. There are around 30 years between Order 66 and the events of The Mandalorian. If that's not enough time for my best friend to forget about the time he tricked me into wearing my retainer post-urinal bath, it's not enough time for the galaxy to forget about the light sword police sorcerers who patrolled the galaxy. You expect him to search the galaxy for the home of this creature and deliver it to a race of enemy sorcerers? Mando would obey the creed of TV sins. By creed, until it is of age or reunited with its own kind, you are as its father. So, just because you say the word creed a million times, you just expect Mando to make that kind of sacrifice with arms wide open? You are a clan of two. Sup, Mando? Cool badge! I have no idea you joined the Moss. The... the what? The Mudhorn Appreciation Society. Yeah, I've got a cousin that rolls with those guys. Nice group, bit intense. No, 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 no. This is my my signet to show. Ah, damn it. IG, please guard the outer hallway. Kudos for saying please, but does IG just take orders from anybody? Until you know it, it will not listen to your commands. <laughs> what is it, a Pokemon? You're telling me this jetpack can disobey its user? Funny how none of the other Mandalorians in the Siege of Mandalore episodes of Clone Wars seem to have rebellious jetpacks. Or at least that's what some nerd told me. Hey, Chad, toss me a cold one while I fix this car and... Oh, I can't do it. I'm the nerd. I'm the nerd. Restock your munitions. Did Mando level up or something? He gets a new outfit detail, a new weapon, and a complete refill of ammo. Is the show going to autosave because the big boss fight's coming up? IG, carry this for Din Djarin. Oh, so now we're just calling him Din Djarin whenever and in front of whoever the f*** we want. How will Mando ever be able to identify future moths who happen to be hunting him down? Hmm? I'd say it's pretty embarrassing to lose to a person fighting with a hammer when you outnumber them and have guns, but all y'all lost to teddy bears on the moon of Endor. The stormtrooper bar continues to plummet, and we will not stop saying that they are still the Empire's weapon of choice. This is the lava river. Unnecessary observations. At some point during the Star Wars holiday special, I send the fact that nobody ever thought to engineer poor R2-D2 legs and arms. Upon reflection, I would like to take that sin back and transfer it to this f nightmare fuel. I don't suppose anybody here speaks droid. Nope, not a single person. Hey, IG, can you think of anyone in the boat that speaks droid? No, me neither. Quite the puzzle. I will eliminate the enemy and you will escape. You don't have that kind of firepower, pal. You wouldn't even get to daylight. He says to the droid that single-handedly took out a small town of stormtroopers while carrying a child in a damn baby Bjorn. Sadly, there is no scenario where the child is saved in which I survive. No scenario? No scenario? That is a mighty amount of confidence that doesn't account for sudden grogooing Jedi cameos or, well, the more obvious factor that stormtroopers can't shoot 10 cans 10 feet in front of them. What are you doing? Look, we all love T2, but stealing is stealing. And stealing is like one of those actual sins. He missed! He won't next time. He still wants Grogu alive, and you're holding the child, so yeah, he'll continue missing. Come on, baby! Do the magic hand thing! Kids. <laughs> this is forcing badass. Let's go! But also, this works. Shields are a thing in the Star Wars universe, right? Like, we've definitely seen them before. So why don't TIE fighters have them? And don't give me some shit about it being too expensive or cumbersome. If the Rebellion can afford them and fit them on X-Wings, the Empire should have zero issues doing the same. Moth Gideon survives this. Well, would you look at that? The jetpack is still obeying commands. I'm starting to think that the nice lady with the murder hammers was full of shit. Aw, yeah, more ship porn. I love the Razor Crest. I hope it sticks around for a long time to come. He has a f***ing light slash dark slash saber slash sword thing? Why the f*** is he only busting this out now? In fact, why is the show only busting this out now? It's as if they've been saving it for some big end of season sting. Oh... You're right, I have a horrible, horrible knee. aren't the droids you're looking for. Those are the shrieking eels! You! Coming in too hot! Ease up on the front! Watch for that crosswind! Level it out! Aim for the numbers! Let the dip your left wing! My name is Walter Hottenhofer and I'm in the pharmaceutical business. 
Anyone else? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? Hello, Mrs. Pig. Hello, Mrs. Sheep. Can Pepper talk to Susie, please? I would like to rage. <laughs> I can't. I kill you. Now, think of the happiest things. It's the same as having wings. Have fun storming the castle. Welcome to Space the Infinite Frontier. We've got a great show lined up for you. Such a large bounty. For such a small package. Size matters not. Have you ever removed your helmet? Well, actually, that's none of your business, Christy. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. Are you sure? No matter what, you got to strip. How do I look? Like a hood ornament. How do I know I can trust you? Because got more flows than Obi Wan Kenobi. Oh, Lilu Dallas Multipass. Does anybody have any tape out there? I want to put some tape over the death button. Don't touch anything. You're not my dad. <laughs> Sir, I've read a lot about your people. What do you mean, you people? I'm gonna need one more thing. It's just we're putting new cover sheets on all the TPS reports before they go out now. So if you could go ahead and try to remember to do that from now on. Do you mind if I ask you something? Go ahead. How long has it been since you've taken that off? Tobias was a never nude, which is exactly what it sounds like. First lesson, sticking with the pointy end. You'll shoot your eye out, kid. This is it, Maverick. I'm gonna hit the brakes, he'll fly right by. Shit, he's gonna get a walk on us! Take my love, take my land, take me where I cannot stand. Hey, droid. I'm a hunter. I'm looking for some work. Tell you the truth, I don't give a sh. Wait, wait, wait. I, I thought you needed work. I don't want your life. If you go after her, you won't make it past sunrise. I never uh, had a kiss when I wasn't one of the kissers. This is a fertile land, and we will thrive. We will rule over all this land, and we will call it this land. You know, I really should thank you. You're my ticket into the guild. Nobody cares. How can we be sure he's the one? Being the one is just like being in love. No one can tell you you're in love. You just know it. You want to be a bounty hunter? You're going to need a bigger boat. The Mandalorian's worth more than you are. Legend. Wait for it. And I hope you're not lactose intolerant, because the second half of that word is dairy. Don't mess with the bull, young man. You'll get the horns. It's off. That means I turn it on and just walk away. Let's all see your eyes. Where we're going, we won't need eyes to see. I'll try again. This little fella. I said, put the bunny back in the box. Stop! Or I'll say stop again. What's your name? I'm Batman. You were hired to do a job, right? Dead or alive, you're coming with me. That thing does not obey the laws of physics at all. You big dildo. Eat your f***ing slot. Is it still a hunter? No, but it will protect. Well, here's the thing. When I said that, I was lying. I figured as much. Why else would you return? I did spend some time with an absolutely stunning blonde the other day. I can see why you didn't want to harm a hair on its wrinkled little head. Well, how else am I going to experience motherhood? What do we learn, Palmer? I don't know, sir. I don't f***ing know either. I guess we learned not to do it again. Yes, sir. I don't if I know what we did. Yes, sir. It's uh, hard to say. Jesus Christ, that's Jason Bourne. Identify yourself. Drop it. Dead or alive, you are coming with me. Due to the Nakatomi Corporation's legacy of greed around the globe, they're about to be taught a lesson in the real use of power. You will be witnesses. Hey! It's Enrico Palazzo! If I pull that off, will you die? 
It would be extremely painful. You're a big guy. For you. Well, I don't believe it. It's Henry Bascom, my next door neighbor. He's had enough of being a space ghost. I am not a living thing. Bureaucrat Conrad, you are technically correct. The best kind of correct. What the sh? That wasn't flying. That was falling with style.